Welcome to the Circular Economy Show by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we develop and promote the idea of a circular economy, engage key actors to make it happen, and mobilize system solutions at scale. My name is Laura, and joining me here in the studio today, I have Ella. Thanks for having me, Laura. Really excited to be hosting this episode with you. We have a great lineup for today's episode in which we are going to be exploring the innovations changing the world and making the circular economy a reality. Indeed, to transition to a circular economy, we require radical innovation. Get ready for 45 minutes of innovative startups working across food, fashion, and agriculture, and to hear more about the role of large businesses in accelerating these innovations. Recently, we've seen massive development in the circular economy innovation space, with more and more solutions piloted, proven, and brought to market. And so first, we are going to be hearing from three of these innovative solutions that we are really excited about. We will hear from Sisewi about their method to grow food abundantly in the desert using only sun, sea and wind. And we will also talk about agriculture and hear from Pierluigi Berna from Roth about how they are regenerating the soil, creating additional sources of income for farmers and eliminating waste in Italian farms. But first, I had a chat with Josephine Phillips, the founder and CEO at Sojo, about her innovative business model that is making use of technology to keep clothes in use in London. I want to start by just asking you to tell us a bit more about what Sojo is and how does it contribute to a circular economy? Yes, so thank you for having me, firstly. Um, and secondly, Sojo, well, in, an, in a sentence, I would describe Sojo as like a delivery-like service, but for clothing alterations and repairs. Um, and essentially what that means is we connect customers to local seams to businesses through our app and bicycle delivery service so that people can get their clothes fixed or fitted with a few simple clicks. Uh, now, we wanted to sort of like modernize the age-old, you know, clothing tailoring industry. Um, but we, our mission is really, really aligned with circularity and with sort of trying to make fashion circular and there's sort of three key pillars um, that we use to do this the first being repair so given that we're repairing clothes we are stopping them from going to landfill and we are sort of trying to create a culture in which when things break it's not the bin that they go to it's actually where you look after them you repair them and you can wear them again and the second aspect is tailoring so again we're providing a service that keeps clothes in existence by if you change body shape whether that's losing weight or gaining weight or whether you pass on sort of clothing to someone else in your family you're able to tailor those clothes to your unique body and you're able to sort of fit them around you in order to make clothing dynamic essentially and then the third reason is that it's sort of where the idea for Sojo came from but because of clothing alterations we hope to reduce sizing restrictions when secondhand shopping we want to be a facilitator for more secondhand shopping because sizing is such a big problem when it comes to buying secondhand that we want to really be a partner for that whole sort of market by saying okay if you find something you love that isn't quite your size you can alter it and therefore again we're helping to keep clothes in the sort of circular existence I want to continue by saying, well, clothing repair isn't new, right? But your business model is. It's not something that we've, that we've seen. So I want you to tell us a bit more about the story behind it and how did you get to this concept and this business model? Yes. So, of course, sewing is not new. But what is new is an entire generation of people who don't know how to sew. So I, like most of my contemporaries, did not go through learning how to sew at school. Thank goodness for feminism. Um, I mean, it would be great if we all learned. But yeah, they've stopped sort of doing those gender classes where women are taught how to sew. And because of that, sewing is not commonplace among young people. Equally, going even to the high street and having a relationship with your tailor is not something that is connected to young people. And equally, they are part of this sort of convenience economy where they're used to things like taxis and food and beauty services at their fingertips on their phone. So although the concept isn't new, it, because the market and the, and the sort of generations are new, it's very necessary to keep up with the times and to make sure that if we do want sewing to happen, given the skill set isn't there anymore, we need to make it easy and accessible and we need to connect those young people to experts who have that expertise. And sort of that's what Sojo is doing. And of course, like I mentioned in the beginning, you launched it during the pandemic and you've received, uh, we've seen that you've received quite a lot of interest and you just mentioned uh, young people. So have you seen 
like a change in people's attitudes towards uh, clothes and, and these new business models? Or is this part of a bigger shift in the, in the industry? Definitely, 100%. I'd say that over the last year, over the last three years, but particularly the last year, the sustainable fashion movement in and of itself has really taken off and really, really garnered attention, which has been so important. I think that's for multiple reasons. Firstly, sustainability is on people's agenda in general. You know, we're moving, we're in the climate crisis, and I think people are really becoming more aware of ways they can be more sustainable. But with fashion specifically, and with sort of changing habits specifically over the past year, it's really been about a change in habits that have come about due to the fact that our lives have changed. So slowing down consumption, that's something that's really at the core of what we're doing. Repair isn't about buying new and buying more. It's about looking after what we already have. And I think for the first time over the last year, it wasn't necessary for people to buy outfit after new outfit after new outfit every single week. And instead it was about what do we currently own and sort of taking a step back and thinking how much do we actually need and how much should we actually be buying? And I think being able to ride on this wave of like overarchingly people are becoming more ethical and sustainable in their shopping habits. Also they're becoming, you know, more local instead of global mindset. And they're trying to think more about what they currently have. We really, really fit in really well with that sort of, you know, that three pronged sort of opinion that people are changing towards. And I think that the future is really really bright for us, but also for other businesses that fit into that sort of new way of thinking that people are taking part in. I want to, to, to talk a bit more about how the app works. Um, so let's say now we've had this conversation, I want to start using it, I download the app, what do I need to do? Yeah. So once you've downloaded the app, you put in your postcode, we'll be able to show you your local seamster. Once you've chosen them and we sort of give a picture and a small backstory, you then basically add what you need done to your basket. And it's as simple as selecting trousers, waist in or, you know, trousers, patching a zip or fixing, you know, fixing a hole. And you add that to your basket. And then we get, in terms of alterations, we get the correct sizing in two ways. Firstly, we match it to an item that fits you perfectly, or you can pin it yourself and use our tutorial videos for that. Once you've added it to your basket, one of our riders will come and collect it at a set designated time and date. And then it will come back to you three to five days later, totally fixed or fitted um, for you to love for a lifetime. Thank you. I will check my size to start using it. Um, and. and I saw on your website that you say you want to be more than just an app and a service. What does that mean and what do you want to be? So for me, I think there's so much more than just being a convenience play and being like, oh, I want to get something repaired and we just want to be a convenient way to do that. It's really more about the broader mission and the wanting to change the fashion industry to be more circular and to be such a key player in doing that. And equally, I think it might be important to touch on here as well. The mission that drove me to this concept and to sustainable fashion in general is really linked to sort of my feminism as well. And that there's this like huge disconnect between people in their clothing and then the women who make them or the people who go into making a garment. And I think one thing that I think is really important to us at Sojo is showing the people who are fixing your clothes and sort of spotlighting garment workers and talking about the people within the industry so that it's humanized. Because I think there's such a disconnect between like between sort of like the people buying and the people making. And I think it's very important to remember the social side and the ethical side when it comes to people as well as the planet as well. So I think for Sojo, yes, we're a convenient service. But we're also hoping to make a change in a broader sense in making the fashion industry circular and in a broader sense by helping people's mindsets and their connection to sustainable fashion on an emotional level as well. Thank you so much for joining us today, Keith. I want to start off by asking, fundamentally, why is algae so great? So uh, algae is quite genius. It was the first plant that figured out how to use carbon uh, to make food, really. Um, so when algae was first kind of evolving four billion years ago, the atmosphere of Earth was very carbonated and it wouldn't have supported human life, actually. And so we owe today's atmosphere full of oxygen to algae's discovery of how to breathe in carbon and breathe out oxygen. And that's the first thing we owe. Every second breath we take today is made by algae still. Second of all, it's the world's biggest food source. 80% of the world's food is made by microalgae. And in fact, algae supports more life in the sea, five times more life in the sea, than all plants support on Earth. 
Great. And so tell me now about Sasui. Uh, what is it that you do? Obviously, uh, very passionate about algae, uh, but what is it that you do with it? What we do with it is we, we figured out a way of growing it on a very large scale. I think the algae industry has been in existence for 60, 70 years. Um, people have figured out that algae can do all sorts of wonderful things, but nobody's figured out how to grow a lot of it and nobody's figured out how to grow it cheap enough. And we can talk a little bit more about our technology and why we've unlocked the secret to growing algae on a very large scale. But our goal is to double global algae production from just one site uh, within the next five years. And we want to use it for food to start off with, as a substitute for meat and fish, um, as a healthy protein source, as a healthy source of lipids, oils, uh, omega-3s, and as a source of pigments. So there's so much we can do with it, but that's our first application. What makes you innovators? Essentially, we follow natural principles, and I'll explain that to you in a second. What other algae companies do is they go and find an algae in a library somewhere, uh, and they, it's got the ingredients that they're looking for. So let's say they're looking for a high lipid, a high oil, an oily algae. Uh, they go and find one in the in a library in Maine, and the algae might come from Norway or or somewhere, and they then take it to a laboratory, put it into a test tube, grow it, and they say, that's great, it's got all of the lipids that we need. They create an artificial environment in the lab to grow it, and then they take that algae out into the desert. Most of them fall over from just from the sunlight, and they eventually have to engineer a, uh, an environment in which those algae can survive, which fights off all of the other local algae which are, which are there, and they have to feed it carbon dioxide, pump it in, uh, and they have to feed it nutrients and they pump those in too, usually into fresh water, strangely enough, um, not into seawater. And so what they've done is they've scaled up a test tube. And the consequence of that is it's very high cost and highly engineered. What we have done is we have scaled down the ocean. We take a completely natural system where the algae grow exponentially, fantastically, twice a year. And in the, in the ocean, what algae does is there's some dormant algae there, what's called stationary phase algae. And let's say there's 20 kilograms of it in the ocean. Deep, rich seawater, full of nutrients uh, and very cold, comes and hits those algae in an upwelling event. And as the, the seawater wells up and, and hits the surface, the algae are triggered into an exponential growth phase. And that means they start doubling in their growth every single day. And if you double 20 kilograms, within 30 days, you've got 10 million tons of food. And that's the power of algae. You've got this, this exponentially growing system, uh, which happens in nature. And so what we do is we just scale down what happens in nature. We find local algae. We don't bring in foreign species. Uh, we pump in seawater and we use ambient levels of carbon dioxide and sunlight and put those into big ponds. And so we induce exponential growth in our algae. So we follow completely natural principles. We borrow from nature what it does and get the algae to do what they do in nature. The difference is instead of doing it twice a year, we get that system to work every single day. So we're harvesting algae every day. Some algae systems would harvest once a month. Uh, we grow only with natural inputs. Other algae systems pump things in. Uh, and so we've developed a very natural process. Um, and the byproduct, as I've said earlier, of oxygen, fresh water, and deacidified ocean, which we pump back into the sea, and we deacidify the surrounding ocean. So... So Sasui is a highly scalable business model. As you say, the algae grows exponentially. You're only using sun, sea and wind. We know that there's uh, a huge need for alternative proteins. Um, but of course, getting to this point, I'm sure there are a lot of challenges, a lot of barriers in its infancy. So say we will have been perhaps, you know, one of very few innovators innovating for a circular economy. The, the concept in and of itself was quite young. 
Um, so I wonder if you can share with us, uh, if you're happy to share with us, your learnings uh, from being an innovator in the circular economy and you know, how do you innovate for a circular economy? There are certain values which we hold dear, and I think it's sticking to your values first of all. And the first value is to be natural. Listen to the algae, follow the algae, um, and just always be aware that when you come up with a solution to a problem you're facing, you've got to make that solution a natural solution. So the moment you start over-engineering things, you're starting to distort the way natural systems behave, be careful. And we follow that principle very carefully and closely the whole way through. Second of all, you've got to be relentless. You've got to be dogged and determined, and you've got to bash your way through that brick wall to get through it again and again. And I'm sure all entrepreneurs and innovators know that. You've got to just keep going. We're on the fourth generation of our technology. Um, I'll give you an example of, of a lesson learned. Is in Oman, when we did this, um, we pumped from one pond into the next. And we got some fantastic Italian pumps. They were not up to uh, desert conditions and they failed. So we went and got some Chinese pumps, which were much more hardy, lower cost, replaceable, and they worked better. But when we thought about it, we thought, well, why are we pumping? We shouldn't be pumping. In the sea, there's no pumping. And so we redesigned the system to be gravity fed. And our ponds now gravity drain from one stage into the next. And uh, that was an innovation in and of itself, but it came from following the, the natural principles, the principles as it were of circularity. Uh, so not over-engineering your solution, even when you're tempted to do that, and that's what the engineers are telling you to do, is very important. Uh, I think thirdly um, is, you know, when we, when we looked at how the natural systems were working, we couldn't always understand and learn fast enough. And what we are now doing is we're deploying digital technology and artificial intelligence to understand what's happening in nature. I'll give you an example. Under certain situations, certain environmental conditions, algae will produce more oils than proteins. So when you starve the algae of nutrients, they produce as a natural response, they produce oils. Or when you overfeed them light, they will produce more pigments. We understand that that's something that they do, but the exact timing and process of it is something that we can't quite get our head around without the digital platform. And we've built a digital technology which monitors and measures what's happening in our system and tells us how nature is behaving. And so we've got an interaction between natural intelligence and artificial intelligence, which together give us the ability to create a system which we can operate to its natural potential. So I'm hearing that iterating is really important, but actually taking a step back and understanding the data um, is really important as well, rather than just kind of steaming ahead and, and just trying lots of different things. Exactly. So nature learns slowly, it takes four billion years to perfect its system. We have to learn fast in order to respond to the growing climate crisis. And so we need to mobilize all of the tools and all of the intelligence and, uh, that, and that nature has and the artificial intelligence tools and digital tools that we've got to help us to do that. And so I think it's combining the best of us and the best of nature, uh, our best of our values and the best of our technologies that'll help us get there. So I can say that uh, the problem we decided to solve uh, in the agricultural sector it, uh, is with digestate, uh, which is generated from biogas plants. And I can say that the main benefit of the great innovation of our project is that we are able to transform digestate from biogas plants into profits for farmers. But you will ask why for us digestate is a problem. So let me explain that our project started from the daily analysis and personal observation of what has been happening in our land. Because I and the founders of the road company 
have been living for many years in the Po Valley, which is an important agricultural area located in northern of Italy. And what we have realized is that in recent years, the development of modern agricultural production system has generated the building of many anaerobic digesters and biogas plants. In fact, today in Italy, we have more than 1,800 biogas plants, and this number rises to 18,000 plants if we consider all over Europe. And, you know, these plants, we, we realize, we know that have been built with a very positive purpose because they are able to transform organic waste to produce clean energy. But at the same time, on the other hand, we realized that they have a very negative collateral effect, that is the production of a huge volume of digestate for farmers. And digestate for farmers is simply a waste that must be discharged. So the final result is that nowadays we have hundreds of 10 trucks moving back and forth from farms to waste disposal collectors, transporting digestate all around our Po Valley. This means an increase in terrible traffic on the roads, and this means an increase in carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere. So we think that maybe the balance between the positive effect of the clean energy created with biogas plants the reduction of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere has become negative because of the increasing in the CO2 emissions in the atmosphere produced by the management of di digestate as a, as a waste. And the, the super crucial element is that we must consider that this digestate is a waste and is managed as a waste, but actually is made by 96% of water. And the remaining 44% components are nutrients. So what at the moment is, has been treated as a waste actually is a resource, is water, and, and it's another important resource. So, for us, this is not a simple problem. This is a really shame to, to waste water. That's why we decided to focus, to find a solution to, to treat this digestate in, in a different manner in order to recover the water contained in, in the digestate. And we have been able to recover not only the water contained in the digestate, but also the solid component which could become a very powerful fertilizer and biostimulant. So tell us a bit more what you do with it. What is what you said you are turning, uh, you know, this kind of waste into profits for farmers. So what is what are you doing about it? Yes, we mean profits for farmers because we have a very quite complex and sophisticated technology. Uh, the, the package is a, a, an integration of a three-step technologies. So, so we have uh, multiple processes occurring uh, during this treatment. We process uh, evaporation, drying, mixing. We have a last step of fusion and inoculation of microorganisms in the solid component. So the first step is uh, simply to we are able to extract the, the water from, from digestate, so we separate um, water and uh, the, the solid components. The water can easily be recovered and used in many, many ways. Then we also process the solid uh, component of the digestate. That's the most important part of, of the of our uh, project, because in a completely natural way, we um, have a biotechnological engineering process occurring, mixing these uh, nutrients, original nutrients, with an additional uh, microorganism, so that the final result is a very powerful biostimulant fertilizer 
which has a very, very high added value for the market. That's why we, we call, we say that we can offer a profit for farmers, because farmers have the chance to, to save money from avoiding to discharge the digested, but they can create a product which is ready to be sold on the market. So it's, it's a great advantage, I, I would say. It's a great advantage also for the environment because we are talking about a completely natural fertilizer, a completely natural biostimulant, which is going to address a, another big problem of the modern agricultural production system. I have one last question for you, and it's very briefly, what's next? For road, well, yeah, we have, you know, we are a startup. We have just uh, uh, started to um, to make a commercial activity to to increase the, the knowledge, the awareness of our project here in Italy. We would like to expand in all over Europe, but we have already our, um, we are grounding the first industrial plant on a farm capable of processing 6,000 tons of digestate per year. And we expect to be able to reach five plants in the next year. And also to raise awareness in the agricultural world about our, our um, startup. There you go, three examples of emerging circular economy startups that are contributing to eliminate waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use and regenerate natural systems. So we've heard now from a handful of exciting innovators already, but there are plenty more out there. We are seeking startups to become part of the Alan MacArthur Foundation community, to join our online community platform and access insights, events and resources, as well as have the opportunity to connect with other circular economy practitioners. Selected startups will also be given the opportunity to feature as part of a circular economy startup database soon to launch on the Foundation's website. So to register, follow the link which should pop up any moment in the chat window or visit the network page of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's website. So Ella, we've heard from the emerging innovators, but what's the role of big businesses in all of this? So AB and Bev is the company behind beverage brands such as Budweiser and Corona Beers and leads the 100 plus accelerator, working with startups who can support their circular economy and climate goals. Hi, Carolina. So very quickly to kick us off, for those of us who may not know already, what is AB and Bev? Thank you, Ella. For those that don't know AB InBev, we're the largest brewer in the world. We have operations in over 50 countries and more than 200,000 employees. And possibly we produce some of your beloved brands like Budweiser, Corona, Stella Artois, amongst others. Great. So lots of people should now be very familiar. Um, and can you share with us some of AB InBev's climate and circular economy goals and explain why they're so important to you as a business? Of course, being a beer producer, we depend on a thriving environment for sure. So that's why we believe that sustainability can no longer be part of our business. It should be our business. And we have very ambitious 2025 sustainability goals on smart agriculture and water stewardship, but also a big focus on circular packaging and climate action. On the circular packaging front, our goal is to have 100% of our product pack, uh, packed in returnable, packaging or in packaging that is made of the majority of recycled content. And then on the climate action front, our goal is to have 100% of our purchased electricity from renewable sources and also to reduce 25% of our emissions across our value chain. This is a science-based target, but of course, we know that this is not enough. This is why we're already having very serious internal discussions about uh, the zero net a roadmap. And of course, innovation is really important to a lot of those things. A lot of the answers to some of those questions to get you to those points will be uh, solutions that perhaps haven't even been invented or tried and tested yet. So um, given that, what is the 100 plus accelerator and what are the goals of the program? 
Excellent. Thank you, Ella. This is a very important question because when we launched our global sustainability goals back in 2018, we knew that we couldn't solve all of the problems ourselves. No one company in the world can solve these complex problems on its own. And we know We know and we knew back then that we needed innovators. We needed brilliant minds across the world that would help us reach and close the many gaps that we had. So that's why in 2018, we launched our 100 plus sustainability accelerator, where we began accelerating startups across the world, giving them some funds to pilot their solutions within our operations. So we opened the door to them. And of course, for the successful one, we scaled them up and helped them grow at, in a way that they never imagined. But of course, this has gotten great results for the company, eh, not only from a sustainability perspective, because of course, working with startups and innovators is helping us reach our goals faster, for sure. But of course, this is bringing savings, this is bringing new sources of revenue, it's creating so many benefits in the company. And Since the beginning, our dream was to have other partners join because, as I mentioned, no one company can solve these challenges on its own. And the challenges that we face are the challenges of the industry. That is why uh, this year we're very, very proud and happy because Unilever, Coca-Cola and Colgate Palmolive joined the accelerator. So the accelerator is completely different now because we are taking it to a next level. We are co-funding together in joint pilots across the world. We're about to announce our next cohort for this year. And we think that if we partner with these other three amazing companies, we will be able to accelerate these solutions and help these startups grow in a way that we never thought that we could have. Yeah, and that's something that we're really passionate here uh, about here at the foundation is the need for collaboration and the understanding that no one organization, as you say, can do this alone. Um, I think that's really interesting because all of those companies are really major companies. Um, they have pretty incredible internal uh, research and development capabilities. So why is it that you think that the innovators are so important? How is it changing uh, the way that you're doing things to have those entrepreneurs and those slightly different setups uh, coming in to join you and to, to collaborate? That's a very interesting question. And of course, we do have many employees across the world. As I mentioned, we are a family of 200,000. Uh, and amongst them, we have very solid R&D teams. However, 200,000 people are not the world, right? And we need to go beyond our walls. We don't have all the answers. We don't have all the ideas. We also have our internal biases. And we need, of course, to go outside and get to know all these innovators that are thinking outside the box, that are possibly seeing things that we're not seeing, um, to work with them, to partner with them and test their solutions. Um, we have known these uh, for the very beginning, uh, and this is why we decided to launch the 100 Plus Sustainability Accelerator. And I would also say another thing, and is that when you create this type of platforms, the accelerator, you also create the enabling conditions to start testing new technologies that on your daily life, that you have targets, you have a busy schedule, you have so many things going on, you wouldn't test um, even if that solution came right next to you, right? So um, that is why I think that going outside our roles is very important, but also creating these platforms that will enable the company and set up the space for us to have an open mind and test new solutions. Great. And I think um, for me personally, what I think is really exciting about the 100 Plus Accelerator is that there's this real focus on piloting. And I think what an incredible opportunity for these relatively small stage startups to be able to not only prove their concept, but do so with the support of businesses who have experience with the customers and experience with this, this major infrastructure. Um, and I wondered, have there ever been any surprises when you've been going through this process? Are there any stories that you can share with us of where things perhaps have turned out slightly differently from what you anticipated or, or you learned something new? Well, we have many stories. Throughout the last uh, two years, uh, we've had two cohorts and we've accelerated 36 startups across the world from 16 countries. This year, and this is something that it's completely out of the brand new because we have not announced um, the cohort yet, but we will accelerate another 
round of 36 startups. So we are duplicating what we have done for the um, past years from over 15 countries. So of course we are filled with um, really good successful stories. In fact, from these 36 startups that have already been through the program, more than 50% have long-term contracts with us and they are working with us in different markets. We had last year a startup from Argentina that is now working in India, and that's the power of the accelerator. But maybe, maybe I'll tell you three uh, interesting stories from completely different pillars that might um, give you a good example of the surprises and the good cases that we've had. So for example, uh, back in 2018, we had this startup uh, called EW Tech, also a Colombian startup, and I'm Colombian, so of course, <laughs> I really like them. And they had a, a solution for us to ch completely change the way that we do SIP. And SIP is the cleaning in place that it's a very important part of the brewing process because, of course, it consumes a lot of water, a, a lot of energy, and also it uses a lot of chemicals to ensure that we have a, a perfect a cleaning. And they offered us a, a completely different way of doing it with a, a completely Env uh, environmentally friendly, biodegradable solution that was made out of salt, energy, um, and water. Um, salt, electricity, and water, sorry. Uh, and we tried it. At the beginning, our teams that were very traditional, they didn't want to they didn't believe in the solution. They thought, this is magic. This is not going to work. Uh, we've been doing uh, the same SIP uh, for many years. But they, at the end of the day, accepted to try this new solution. And it worked perfectly from a microbiological perspective. But it also had many other co-benefits. Like, for example, it, it helped us save 70% of our water use. Also, we didn't need to use... a uh, energy because we didn't uh, need um, hot water for the process. And also the best part of it was that it saved us so many time. We could do with this technology um, the same process in half of the time. So now this small pilot that began in our smallest brewery in Colombia was scaled up uh, to our largest brewery in Colombia. And now we're having conversations of how to implement this new technology uh, all over the world. That's one story. Then we have, for example, all the upcycling startups that I think are just amazing because we believe in a circular world, of course, and waste <laughs> It's no longer waste, you know? We need to bring added value. So it's amazing how from spent grain from our breweries, for example, we can produce so many things from new bioplastic materials that we are trying uh, across the world. So, oh, and also to other food ingredients. So it's amazing how something that many years ago was completely undervalued or that in our best scenario, we were, we were only using for um, feedstock. Uh, now we are actually uh, using it to produce a new materials, like, as I mentioned, plastic or um, new food ingredients for um, human consumption. So that's amazing. And it really marvels me. Uh, and we also want to go beyond that. So this year, we're going to have more upcycling startups, for example. I'll give you some hints. We're going to work with algae, for example, or with black soldier fly that produces protein. So that's also very interesting. And then my third example of something that really surprised us um, is a startup that gave us traceability and visibility throughout our value chain. Being such a large company, sometimes you don't have visibility of everything that is happening in your value chain. And you need this, um, and you need this also for transparency for the consumers and also to understand the communities that work uh, in your value chain and all your stakeholders. And we began implementing this technology with a startup that's called BankQ. BankQ is now in more than 40 countries in the world were very, very proud of what they're doing. And basically through a blockchain technology, they began giving us traceability of all of our smallholder far farmers. And we began knowing who were there, these smallholder farmers, uh, how was the quality of their product. And, and we knew that with the farmers, it was a good success. And then we began trying this technology with other communities. So for example, waste pickers that are 
key for us because thanks to waste speakers, we managed to increase recycled content and have a circular packaging. So I can speak all day about <laughs> the great success stories and it's very hard to choose, um, but they are just so inspiring. And for someone that works and has been working in sustainability for more than 10 years, which is my case, it's really, really inspiring to see these stories because it gives you hope. And we're in a very critical condition. The world is in a very uh, difficult moment and we need to have these stories and accelerate them because we need to focus right now on the solutions. And so finally, if you could implore other big businesses around the world to uh, get involved and to start really collaborating with both other businesses, but also with innovators, what would you say? What are the benefits and why should they be doing it? Well, my first message would be join the 100 plus sustainability accelerator, because even though we are now really four big companies that are working together, four big companies are not enough. We need to change business as usual for a more sustainable one. And doing it alone, it's not cost effective. We need to partner to have like really scalable solutions that are cost effective because we're businesses. We need to have a good business case, right? So the doors are open. We are welcoming companies that want to join us in these efforts. So that would be my first message, join us. And then the second one, I definitely encourage companies to... First, have a big focus on sustainability. Companies that are not focusing on sustainability will not continue to flourish in this century. And we all need to understand this. And of course, if you want to focus on sustainability, innovation is key because we need to change many of the technologies that we were using. We need to like, prepare ourselves for the world that we need, right? So and we cannot do it alone. We need to open and go beside it, beyond our walls to find these innovators and these solutions that are emerging worldwide. And of course, start, starting a business is difficult. So startups really struggle. They are hard workers. And as big companies, we have the power of helping these startups grow and strengthen their teams and test their solutions. And if we help them grow, we're going to help these solutions accelerate. So I think that all companies, if they have the capacity, they should definitely focus on sustainability and innovation. From creating new materials to trailblazing circular business models, the innovations that we have seen today show the potential to radically rethink and redesign everything around us in a way that drives positive business outcomes, reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and of course, regenerate natural systems. And we've also heard how good ideas alone are not enough. We need the right enabling conditions in place to scale these solutions and help them to become even more widespread. And unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, Ella. But we will be back in two weeks at 3 p.m. UK time with more content, insights and conversations on the circular economy. Check our website if you want to find out more about what we have coming up. If you have enjoyed this video, please do like it and share it with your network. And while you are doing that, why not subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook. That way you will be notified every time we go live and you will never miss a thing. Thank you again for tuning into the Circular Economy Show and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks.